Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Wayne Gillett. Uh, now, Wayne, um, for those who don't know him, is uh, emeritus professor. He's a gynecologist and obstetrician, um, kind of subspecializing, I would guess, is that true, in, in in vitro fertilization, but with other skills as well. So he's been involved with IVF uh, in vitro fertilization um, really uh, since its beginning. Um, and um, he trained uh, at the Hammersmith in London in the early 80s, I believe, uh, in um, um, microsurgery and laparoscopic surgery, gynecological laparoscopic surgery and uh, IVF. Um, and he's been involved with that ever since. In, and he's been the leading light in Dunedin in IVF uh, matters since that time. So it's a great pleasure to introduce um, Wayne, and he's going to talk about reproductive medicine in New Zealand, its history and changes. So, Wayne, thank you. Well, kia ora koutou. Um, tēnei te mihi mahana ki koutou. Tēnei koutou, tēnei koutou. Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, thank you, Terence, for that introduction and um, uh, the opportunity to present this lecture, uh, the first of the series, um, the 29th of February. Um, I notice there's uh, no clock here, so um, I'm just hoping if, if I do go beyond the one hour and 50 minutes that I've been allocated, uh, could you let me know? Yeah, thank you. I promise I, I'm only going to try about 45 minutes. Uh, this um, lecture is based on um, one that I gave uh, about two, in 2012 uh, to the Fertility Society of Australia's annual general meeting um, to, to, um, to focus on the achievements that New Zealanders uh, made in reproductive medicine. Uh, many New Zealanders became world-renowned because of their achievements. At the outset, um, I wish to acknowledge uh, Jane Adams, and I, I don't think Jane's here, is she? Um, uh, because she um, gave me a, a, an awful lot of material. In fact, she presented she presented to this forum, I think, parents, uh, about 10 years ago uh, with a similar uh, topic. There are others, too, um, that I want to acknowledge, and these people um, were basically helped me present the original lecture. And as you can imagine, um, I haven't done that lecture ever since. So that's why I need a few notes just to, to help me. Um, this is the scope of the lecture, um, beginning with some of the definitions used in reproductive medicine. Uh, and I'll end with the intriguing story of how New Zealand scientists were the first to clone an endangered species. Uh, the next definition is that of reproductive medicine itself. Although it encompasses a wide range of conditions, it's mostly through infertility that the, the term was derived, particularly when the advent of reproductive technologies came about. In women, uh, it also covers menstruation, ovulation, pregnancy, and the menopause, but it was infertility that the term was originally derived, and it's infertility that I'm going to talk about today. For me, it's been a privilege of being in this field right from the beginning, um, because that is a very young discipline. The next uh, def set of definitions are the, the causes, and I won't uh, dwell on these too much, but just to, to explain that female and male fertility contribute about equally uh, to, the, to the causes. And the, the, the three main ones that I'm going to mention today in the talk uh, around ovulation induction, disorders of uh, the fallopian tube and uh, disorders of sperm numbers uh, or function. Uh, and the final definition is uh, that of um, the assisted uh, reproductive technologies themselves. Um, they include donor insemination, established procedures, donor insemination, intrauterine insemination, uh, in, uh, in vitro fertilization, then IVF using ICSI, and IVF using a sperm donor or a sperm egg, and then pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. There are reg uh, regulated procedures, 
where uh, uh, couples need to go through an ethics committee on a case by case basis to uh, to get approval uh, uh, for those. Now, there's no doubt that Australian scientists uh, have led the world uh, in in ART, uh, and in fact, in the very first um, 22 pregnancies out of IVF, 18 of them came out of Australia. And um, two people um, involved were actually New Zealanders, and I wanted to uh, just describe them and present them. The first is Lloyd Cox, uh, who made his mark in Adelaide. Lloyd actually grew up here in Dunedin. His father was, was the mayor of Dunedin during the Depression. Um, and he went to medical school here, with, uh, got his uh, degree with honours, and came back to the department in the mid 50s as a senior lecturer. Um, Lloyd was really instrumental in making reproductive medicine a credible subspecialty, and he has became the father figure of reproductive medicine uh, pretty well in the world, actually. Um, before assisted reproduction came about, the treatment options for couples experiencing infertility weren't that great. And, um, and I suppose the, the mainstay, believe it or not, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was adoption. Um, then um, ovulation induction came about, and then donor insemination. I talked there about microsurgery from the 70s onwards, but of course, surgery itself was, has been available for many, many years. But, but, but firstly, adoption. I mean, these were the numbers of uh, babies available for adoption in the 1960s. And it's not uh, su too surprising that um, infertile couples didn't need to have treatments because the adopting uh, number of adopting babies uh, was sufficient to, uh, for their needs. But as um, um, uh, single motherhood became less shameful, um, the domestic purposes benefit, et cetera, et cetera, the adopting numbers just dropped and plummeted. And nowadays, there are hardly any uh, babies for adoption. So um, the next person I want to introduce is James Brown. Now, he's another New Zealander, uh, born in, and educated in Auckland. And a scholarship took him to um, Edinburgh, where he quickly became um, an, a world leader in estrogen measurements, and then the use of human pituitary gonadotrophin for the induction of ovulation. He, um, at the remarkable age of 90, he submitted this paper prior to his death in 2009 that was later published in Human Reproduction Update in 2011. And the paper was awarded the most outstanding research paper for 2011 by the American Academy of Fertility Care Professionals. Briefly about gonadotrophins, gonadotrophins FSH and LH are hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland and uh, directly stimulate the ovary or testis. And a, a huge breakthrough in the management of ovulation disorders was the uh, introduction by James Brown and his uh, colleagues of uh, human pituitary gonadotrophin, HPG, which was extracted from human pituitaries. Uh, later, it was uh, replaced by human menopausal gonadotrophin, HMG, uh, derived, uh, extracted from menopausal urine. But nowadays, we use recombinant technology uh, for FSH and LH. Now, the next character I want to talk about is Harvey Carey. He was a professor in Auckland. And he, uh, with James Brown, uh, established an HPG trial uh, in 1962 at National Women's. Now, Harvey was the, uh, the head of the postgraduate school of obstetrics and gynecology. And it was he who created the research environment uh, that led to National Women's becoming a world leader in fetal physiology, rhesus disease, and premature labor. In 1963, he shifted to um, New South Wales as the foundation chair there. Brown at that stage had relocated to Melbourne and he provided the active HPG hormone using pituitary glands supplied and sent over to him from the Auckland uh, um, by the newly formed New Zealand Endocrinology Society. 
Uh, now these pituitary glands were taken from deceased women of reproductive age during postmortems. Uh, Brown sent the purified product back to Auckland for use in the Nash Woman's infertility trial. The next person we want to meet is, is Mont Liggins, who was knighted in 1991, who stands as our most distinguished New Zealander in the field. Professor Sir Peter Gluckman, whom you probably all should know, is on record saying Mont is, is, is without doubt the most distinguished medical scientist New Zealand, that New Zealand has ever produced. His early research was in oral contraceptives and it was he who invented the idea of including sugar pills in the packet. Mont was involved in the uh, New Zealand's HBG trial and in January 1966, he published in Lancet the story behind the world's first surviving quintuplet pregnancy after HPG. The, um, the Lawson twins were born at National Women's Hospital in 1965 to Anne and Sam Lawson. The treatment was not revealed to the New Zealand public because they tried to keep it very secret. But three days after um, their birth, inf information was revealed in the English and Australian press and was then published here. Harvey Carey, uh, now based in uh, Sydney, was one of the several members of the medical profession who roundly criticised the use of HPG, uh, which is slightly ironic because a few years later, he, um, he was responsible for producing a pregnancy with nine babies. Uh, through the drug. Kerry could have actually been, uh, well, could have been the person in Sydney who leaked the, the, the story to the media. Um, a correspondent to The Lancet um, also challenged the use of the term successful, arguing that a better word would have been failure. In the broader uh, New Zealand media too, a few lone voices did question whether the use of HPG was a good idea. Uh, the editor of the New Zealand Women's Weekly uh, wrote a forceful editorial arguing that in light of the thalidomide tragedy of three years prior, uh, that New Zealanders needed to approach fertility drugs with great caution. Now the Lawson story didn't end there. Um, sadly, Anne and Sam split up when the Quins were six and in 1982, Anne was murdered by her abusive second husband. Uh, the, the Lawson Quins have re received a, a lot of media attention over the years, and I think one of them died last year. But despite the HBG um, uh, criticism, National Women's was a thriving institution with world-class scientists in Mont Ligand, as I mentioned, and Bill Liley, and both of them, in fact, were knighted uh, for their work. Uh, it was in this environment led by Dennis Bonham, who was Kerry's successor, uh, that was the starting point for Freddie Graham. On several occasions in the early 1980s, Bonham argued that fertility problems were the highest priority in his department. At that time, um, because of the Australian clinic success, women from New Zealand were flocking over to Australia in big numbers uh, for the IVF. But Freddie, uh, who arrived in uh, 1974 as a registrar, took a more, as he took on more senior roles, he, he was very influential in getting IVF started. His breakthrough to establish um, IVF came when Pamela Binker, pictured here on the right, came out to work for Mont Liggins. But because of her experience in IVF embryology, Liggins supported Freddie in getting going with the IVF. And by 1983, the team achieved its uh, first um, fertilization of a human egg. It was this news of the um, Freddie's so called research, secret research, that came to the attention of a shocked uh, hospital board and media. And the program came to a grinding halt uh, while the ethics committee met to decide the program's future. Uh, during the, the week that the program was halted, the hospital received an outpouring, a huge outpouring of public support, including a lot of financial donations. 
And uh, perhaps spurred on by this positive public reaction, the Ethics Committee decided that the IVF program would be allowed to proceed on a research basis. Somehow the funding would be found. And just before Christmas of 1983 came the announcement that two of the women in the program were 13 weeks pregnant uh, and New Zealand was going to uh, have their own homegrown IVF babies. The first baby was born in 1984. And unlike her famous English and Australian counterparts, and certainly again, very much like the Paul Lawson Quinns, her parents went to great lengths to keep the, her identity secret. And the, the baby girl's um, announced, the birth announcement was announced 10 days after. And, and the members of the IVF team were not allowed to visit uh, her in hospital. And this photo of, of Freddie and Pam was taken at the parents' home. It wasn't until June 2009 that the identity of the baby girl in question, Amelia Bell, now age 25, was revealed in an exclusive interview in North and South. As uh, IVF uh, be uh, became established, Richard Fisher, uh, there on the left, uh, joined the team, as did scientist uh, John Peake. Uh, John is pictured here with the IVF buggy uh, at National Women's. It was Pam Binkard who made it from an infant incubator, creating a warmed environment for the microscope to protect the egg. And it was possibly the first of its type in the world. This was certainly visionary at the time and was the forerunner of today's modern IVF workstations. IVF uh, was certainly uh, practiced very differently in those days. Um, I'm not sure whether you can read that, but it was practiced all over the hospital. And uh, you can understand why um, Freddie and um, um, Richard established um, the, the, the first private IVF service in Auckland. Um, and they certainly uh, gave New Zealand a presence in IVF and, uh, internationally. And, and Richard is the um, is the first, is in fact, is the only New Zealander who's been a president of the Fertility Society of Australia. I feel John Peake on the right um, is the star, is the is, is the star of the show. He's the one that has kindled the highest values um, and standards within our profession, and he held the whole New Zealand service together, pretty much all of the, all the clinics together. And it's not surprising that. Uh, Fertility Associates now is um, manages pretty well most of the IVF work in New Zealand. The second clinic to open uh, was here in Dunedin when Tom Sidey founded uh, uh, IVF Otago in 1987. Another clinic soon followed and by the mid 1990s there were about six clinics uh, around New Zealand. This slide demonstrates uh, by the size of the boxes uh, how unequal the available public funding was with Auckland and Christchurch receiving much more funding per capita. In Dunedin, although we had a limited IVF funding, we almost had unlimited funding for the microsurgical reversal operations for both male and female sterilization, just to demonstrate how funding models were non-existent. And I'll come back to the surgery shortly. This, uh, this, uh, this inequity or an unequal uh, uh, distribution of funds changed in the early 1990s when the New Zealand government um, directed the use of what we call CPACs for all surgical uh, procedures um, to um, Where am I up to? Yeah, it was to, it was to um, it was really to to provide transparency and consistent consistencies a consistency in decisions relating to treatment. And scoring tools were developed for all surgical disciplines uh, with a score of hundred to zero. And I'm pleased to say I've got a couple of orthopedic surgeons here tonight because orthopedics is a, was one of the very first ones to be presented and. Um, but with the, the number of points that were allocated um, to get, gain access varied around the country. This wasn't the case for um, gynecology and uh, uh, IVF services, 
and I was responsible for the IVF one and very much involved in the gynae surgery. The, um, it's fair to say that the IVF um, clinicians saw the tool as, a, as one that would ensure consistency and provision of services. And I, and I think it's the only one that has really worked um, uh, certainly up until about 10 years ago, maybe made not to have replacements. Um, and one of the reasons why it worked was because we knew what our budget was and uh, all the IVF clinicians in New Zealand uh, worked together. In um, 2000, at the beginning, there was only one uh, treatment per woman, but in 2004, with additional funding, we were able to get two cycles of treatment but in 2004, we also were limited to only producing, putting one embryo back. That's the SET there. Um, prior to that, um, multiple embryo transfers were common. And even in Dunedin, we had probably three or four pregnancies that were triplets. This study by Cindy Farquhar and others suggested the CPAC model that New Zealand introduced may have contributed to higher pregnancy rates and live birth rates in New Zealand compared to Australia across uh, uh, all age groups. It was suggested that the CPAC tool resulted in women being better able to benefit from IVF compared with those in Australia. In particular, in New Zealand, the process required women to improve their lifestyle by losing weight and stopping smoking. Before I leave IVF, uh, there are two more stories to tell. And this is uh, uh, Earl Wilson, um, uh, who worked here in Dunedin, and Terence remembers him. Um, interesting enough, and I think you mentioned that he might have been working with embryos back then. Uh, I'm sure there must have been animal embryos, but um, this um, photograph of him um, in the, at the Australian Obstetrical and Gynecological Research Society is shows Earl here. At his funeral in 2006, it was said that while working in Sheffield in the late 1960s, he published the first paper. Now that's interesting what you said, Terence. Um, along with Tiger Beavis uh, of Amniocentesis fame, I'm, I've never found this paper, and I spoke to Professor Ian Cook from Sheffield to see if he could give shed some light into it. And what happened was Beavis claimed that he had cultured embryos in a dish on the windowsill of his office. Um, and at a BMA meeting in Hull in 1974, also claimed that three children had been born from IVF. But he never provided evidence. And Anne recalls finding reporters snooping around the hospital at night trying to find out. Uh, but um, Beavis went to ground after that and the story was never heard ever again. Earl Wilson successfully um, applied, uh, I'm sorry, unsuccessfully applied for the chair here in the, in the late uh, 1970s. And had he done so, I'm convinced that he would have brought IVF to, uh, to Dunedin uh, possibly before, um, before uh, Auckland. The second story I want to uh, tell about IVF uh, shows Ro Lord Robert Winston uh, who's in the uh, yellow and red tie when he visited our department about 20 years ago. Now, Professor Lawrence Wright is next to him, and next to Lawrence is uh, Professor Dick Seddon. Robert Winston became famous for many reasons. Uh, some of you may remember he featured on the Human Body series. He was the presenter on the TV series, The Human Body. But he initially came to fame as a microsurgeon. Yes, he was a gynecologist. Um, um, in Hammers at Hammersmith. And this all started before IVF. And I had the great privilege of working uh, for him uh, the last two years as a senior registrar. And at the time, his clinic was the largest in Europe. And he also started the IVF program then. Uh, I got involved with IVF, but I remember how terrible the results were. We were working all uh, hours of the day um, getting out of bed to collect eggs at three o'clock in the morning. Um, 
And so IVF was very unrewarding and, and certainly difficult and very unsuccessful despite one or two successes. I came back to New Zealand then in 1983 and decided that I didn't want to touch IVF with a barge pole. Um, instead, I uh, developed uh, the microsurgery service. To me, it was a treatment that seemed so much more sensible at the time. Now, under, uh, um, under magnification with the microscope, careful restoration of, uh, of tubal and ovarian anatomy is possible. And all these, con all these conditions are consequences of pelvic inflammation, sexually transmitted diseases, and complications from prior surgery. Microsurgery uh, enabled precision surgery and careful handling of delicate tissues. And tubal anastomosis uh, was, was much easier using magnification. The possibly um, most benefit from the microsurgical approach came from what we call proximal disease, a stenosis um, where the tube joins onto the uterus, um, which is possibly not due to inflammatory disease, it's possibly even due just to normal menstruation. Robert Winston was the first to perform this operation. Now, the other benefit of having a successful surgery was that you were able to cre form, uh, create families from just the one operation. And in a study uh, that I did of uh, 300 odd cases here in Dunedin, um, um, the, in, when, when, in following these women up, I was able to establish how many women had two or more children. Now, these conditions, some of these conditions only had about a 10 or 20% chance of success on their own. But what I found surprisingly is that um, the chances of a second normal pregnancy was very good, even though the original pathology was poor, suggesting that a pregnancy itself uh, may well improve uh, tubal structure and function. I want to um, illustrate this uh, with Sally. And Sally um, has given me permission to present her story, um, where she was referred to me in 1985 for a microsurgical anastomosis of her only fallopian tube. And Sally and Ken had a devastating loss of two of their three children in a, a car accident. Sally had one fallopian tube. And when I uh, advised her about the prospects of the success, I said that her chances of having another child was 30% at the most. This is in contrast to modern day serializations, which have pretty well normal fertility with this operation. Um, before I forget, because um, uh, I'm sure I will, uh, the, the sad, even though uh, the, the sad fact is that microsurgery is no more. Um, because IVF has just taken over. Um, IVF has the advantage of immediacy. In other words, you, you either know you're pregnant or not from just one treatment. Whereas in surgery, um, uh, you, women often had to wait one or two or three years before they had their child. And this was the case with Sally, because even though I gave her a poor uh, a prognosis, she did conceive about 18 months after and here's um, uh, Kate in the middle, who's now 37 years of age. And she had two more, and Sally had two more without any delay straight after. So she ended up with three children. When uh, on the, the, these, are the, the, these are the three with their older surviving brother a bit later. When I serialized uh, Sally uh, after her three pregnancies, I found that her fallopian tube, which wasn't very good when I first last saw it, was now perfectly normal, and which sort of um, supported my hypothesis that maybe the pregnancy doesn't achieve a lot of good. But unfortunately, that hypothesis will never ever prove because microsurgery is no more, um, which is really, really sad. When it comes to clinical practice, 
with assisted reproduction. Arguably, New Zealand's most important contribution on the world stage has been leading the world in openness about gamete donation. And the beginning uh, can be attributed to Joy Ellis, who began working as a social worker at National Women's in 1977, in a small donor private practice run by Dennis Bonham. Now, to give some context to this, the only realistic treatment option for male infertility prior to the 1990s was sperm donation. And in the 1970s and 1980s, donor insemination was frequently performed under secrecy with donors remaining anonymous. Now, the advent of ICSI, this is working, isn't it, Cliffs? That's good. Uh, the discovery of ICSI in the mid-1990s changed treatment options a lot. For the first time, male infertility could be treated uh, with IVF because you only needed one, one sperm, and that was the sperm that was just injected into that egg. Getting back to Joy, uh, she made her views very clear that donor identity and full disclosure was the right thing. And as Joy reflects, this was not easy because Donham had a very different, different view. She held her ground and started offering group information sessions to the people who were waiting for that service and discussing children's rights, the children's rights and the burdens of secrets within groups. And as Freddie Graham gained more responsibility with infertility service, he supported Joy's stance. The passing of the Adult Adoption Information Act in 1985 also added weight to the arguments about what was in the child's best interests and the damaging effects of secrets within families. Fertility Associates, uh, New Zealand's first private clinic, uh, and, uh, started recruiting in 1990, only donors who were willing to, uh, for identity release. And shortly after that, all New Zealand clinics agreed they too would follow this practice. And this, uh, this practice probably was 10 years before any other country in the, in the world, pretty much. And I, I just want to show another study I did uh, uh, from an HRC grant of, of 80 couples who were followed up. Um, having conceived by donor insemination in between 1984 and 1990. The study was done when the children were between 13 and 19, and only 55% of the children actually knew about their donor identity. And I, I must say, having been part of all that system, I really feel rather ashamed now, standing here, that I was part of that early, early uh, practice. The strength of um, New Zealand's position was made even stronger by the immense contribution uh, from the psychosocial services with Vivian Adair in Auckland, and particularly from Ken Daniels, pictured here. Ken has been a giant in the field and has published over 130 papers, 30 book chapters, and two books. And this book here has had a huge impact in many countries. Um, his entire focus has been on the psychosocial issues for children and families have resulted from assisted reproduction. His influence on the family building approach to gamete and embryo donation has been actively taken up as policy or legislation in 10 jurisdictions, including the United Kingdom, United States, and other countries. It is fair to say that the Heart Act, uh, the legislation that provides regulatory framework of assisted reproduction in Zealand confirmed current practice rather than introducing change. I think critical to its success has all come, also come from the influence of Māori, who believe that the individual must have access to information concerning their biological connection. And just to remind you, New Zealand probably led the world by a good 10 years on this. At this stage, I want to acknowledge the extraordinary contribution of Cindy Farquhar and the group in the Cochrane collaboration that has transformed evidence-based practice. This is the Cochrane logo. And as New Zealanders, we're very proud to know that the, the first trial on this logo uh, represents our very own randomised trial that established Mont Ligon's career. The image of the, uh, the first seven trials was, um, was chosen uh, as the Cochrane logo 
because it made a because the meta analysis that, that described this made a huge huge difference. But it's interesting that it took ten years um, before it became um, common practice, and even in places like the United States, it took another ten years. In other words, a total of twenty years after Liggins first published his paper before they accepted uh, this work, and tens and thousands of babies have unnecessarily died as a consequence. Um, Cindy founded the Cochrane Menstrual uh, Disorders oops, um, and Subfertility Group in 1996, uh, and here she is with Martin Liggins. And it's of interest that Archie Cochrane, who um, founded the Cochrane um, collaboration, um, gave the wooden spoon uh, to obstetrics and gynecology for being the least evidence-based specialty, which I'm a bit ashamed of as well. Uh, but thanks to Cindy, uh, who's pictured here, uh, she certainly turned it around from the New Zealand point of view. I will, um, Cindy's um, Cochrane Group um, is extraordinary. Uh, they've published well over 250 reviews. And not only has uh, Cindy uh, been such a, a giant in this um, field, she's also been the principal investigator of 12 other clinical trials, uh, many with a lot of international collaboration, um, including, um, including this one, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'll just skip over the next couple. Um, uh, this here is um, just just briefly to describe um, the other work out of Auckland from the Liggins Institute. The the, the group, the Liggins Institute, was um, founded by Sir Peter Gluckman, um, and they, even though they work mainly on early life um, research, they certainly involve assisted reproduction as well. Now, to finish, I want to um, acknowledge. Um, the contributions from the uh, the preclinical science world and also the agricultural world. And to begin with, I'm pleased Rebecca, I think Rebecca's here. Um, um, in our own university, we have the Center for Neuro Neuroendocrinology who lead the world in preclinical discovery research and the neural control of reproduction, especially GNRH neurons. And now the largest uh, cluster of researchers in this field, and they've already engaged in exciting clinical collaborations. The director is Rebecca, who's in the audience, and who replaced, uh, in fact, who replaced Dave Grattan, who replaced Alan Herbison, who was the founding director. Uh, Rebecca gave me this slide yesterday, which summarizes um, their work uh, being um, uh, over $96 million of funding since 2083 and a very impressive um, uh, publication list. And they have an exci exciting future and already are involved in collaborations, uh, clinical collaborations. Uh, for example, there's one uh, with using Kispept and, and IVF. Now to Ken McNatty. Ken, um, Sadly, died last year uh, while walking in Spain. Uh, but he um, has made outstanding contributions to the biology of the human ovary. In recent times, uh, his uh, work has been in oocyte regulation. But he um, has, has he really came to fame um, as an established leader in the field when he worked in Edinburgh, where he made his mark being the first to work out the microenvironment of the human follicle and oocyte, and especially the pre-ovulatory follicle and corpus luteum. Uh, Ken, uh, from the previous slide, you may have noticed, worked in Wallaceville, and another uh, ag research site of note was Ruakura, where the next two uh, uh, people are the principals of the next two stories. Now, the first is Jeremy um, uh, Thompson, is on the right, David Wells is on the left. Yeah, but Jeremy Thompson, Jeremy Thompson's team uh, at Ruakura were the first, well, sorry, weren't with the first, were the leaders in defining 
suitable culture media that have also made huge differences in human IVF. Jeremy happens to be an Aussie but now working in Adelaide, but I think we can claim his New Zealand presence was a success here. The, the major discovery was simply by uh, removing maternal serum from the culture media and replacing it with amino acids and bovine serum albumin. This changed success rates overnight to, to help make uh, what IVF is today. David Wells is the next story, and it relates to an island called Enderby Island, which um, is one of the northernmost islands down of the Auckland Islands, the 300 kilometers um, south of here. And um, David's, David, David's group are, are world leaders in cloning uh, technology. In 1991, the Department of Conservation in New Zealand decided that the Enderby cattle, and there were about 50 of them, needed to be culled because they were destroying the plantations uh, for the plants and the animal life. And so they went down there, they culled them, the scientists went with them to collect the eggs and the sperm, and they were hoping to uh, resurrect the, the animal, the Enderby cow, um, by IVF. But the, the sperm was absolutely disastrous, and and uh, over with over with hundreds hundreds of attempts, they just did not achieve a single success. However, they found a year later they found a, a lone cow still on the island, and uh, this cow, who was named Lady, was brought back to New Zealand, and using um, her own eggs and the sperm uh, that was disastrous uh, eventually uh, gave birth to the cow, the, the calf in front of Lady, called Darby. But that was after about 35 attempts at IVF. So everyone, everyone to try and resurrect this endangered species, endangered because the New Zealand government killed them, um, uh, they turned to cloning. And by six or seven years later, uh, they established the first um, cloned animals from endangered species. Now, the sad thing about this to me is that they missed out on the first cloned animal by about a year because Dolly the sheep, uh, who's now got a statue of herself, um, is, uh, was the first. Um, I tried to uh, tell the story to my daughter, who's also sitting there in the audience, and I got the end of it and then I, I discovered the end today because I rang David Wells just to find what the end was and what happened is that um, a farmer in Canterbury took over these cattle. Darby by the way um, provided the sperm to keep the, 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 the clan going and now the Enderby cows are, are up in Hawke's Bay there are about 30 of them with calves being born every year so that's the end of the story that's Lloyd. But I will finish, and I, it's almost six, but I will finish by telling the story of Jane that highlights to me the power of modern reproductive medicine. But it also honors uh, neonatal medicine as a powerful collaborator in what we've been doing. Now, Jane uh, and, An and Andrew were referred to our service um, uh, because of uh, Jane had experienced 10 miscarriages. Now, one miscarriage is a burden, but having 10 is absolutely devastating. And particularly when, in Jane's case, um, uh, at least half of those miscarriages were in mid pregnancy. Uh, it was just hugely devastating. So, what we did is we used a hormone called GNRH, a GNRH agonist. Oh, she, she had a condition called adenomyosis of the uterus, where the uterus is, um, uh, is replaced, the, the muscle of the uterus is replaced by bleeding sites and scarring, so that when a, when a pregnancy occurs, the uterus cannot accommodate the pregnancy and miscarriage occurs. So what we did was we gave her this GnRH, which shut down the uterus for, um, for up to six months. And um, 
uh, the idea was to get rid of these bleeding sites. Then we uh, gave uh, set up for IVF, and she got pregnant the first after one month of this GnRH. But unfortunately, she had a twin pregnancy, which was a bit of a disaster. At 18 weeks, she miscarried uh, twin number one. Uh, her name was Jessica. Now, Jane, by the way, has given me permission to tell the story again, so uh, as has Andrew. Uh, and uh, with seven weeks to go before the, the twin two could be viable, we had a hell of a, a challenge on our hands because having a retained twin like that is pretty, pretty unusual. We eventually got there 25 weeks. And here's Jane and Andrew and Emma. And Emma was about 700 grams at birth. And here she is here. Uh, and here she's got a ring around her arm. And the, the, my fam uh, favorite photo is with, uh, with Andrew. And um, Emma uh, also gave me permission to tell her story. Um, she's here at age of seven, but she's now 17. And um, ladies and gentlemen, that I believe represents how uh, great reproductive medicine is. Thank you. Good sense. Can you tell me when, how Maori culture looks at IVF? Do they have reservations about it from a cultural point of view, or do they enthusiastically embrace it? How do they view it? I think the latter, uh, because they um, respect fertility and um, they realise IVF has a quite a huge part to play. Uh, and I think um, they have equal access to IVF as Europeans do in this country. Question: What happened to Will Wilson after he he was here for a while and then he didn't get the chair? Then he, just, oh, he disappeared, a, didn't he? He took up a position in the World Health Organization as one of the heads of the Human Reproduction Program. Yes, and um, he retired at about sixty-five, came back to Paikea, and he wrote a book on um, how to age or how to live in old age because he realized that most people live to an older age, older than they thought they believed. And um, so he wrote this book and then after that he died. So uh, <laughs> it was quite sad. He was an extraordinarily flamboyant character, yeah. remember, as a student. Uh, anyway, other people remember him as well. Any other questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, just one, um, Wayne, that was really good. I'm just wondering if you could um, comment on um, if you think there's a need to change the criteria for eligibility to IVF so that more people can access it, or is it other other um, criteria set at about the right level? Um, when we um, when we um, derived the, the 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 point system. We set that threshold at a lower level um, so that uh, we could have a certain number of people, but the government wouldn't give the funding. And unfortunately, to, despite many attempts to change it, they, they, we haven't succeeded in more funding. We have tried a number of times to change. For example, at the moment, the BMI of 32 excludes women from having IVF. And the, the reason why we uh, excluded them in the first place was we believe that pregnancy uh, was more dangerous for them and therefore more costs and all that but that's been disproved and so and of course as you know and the thing about your question you know, is that maori and polynesians have a higher bmi than average and so they are they are um they are disadvantaged by that rule but unfortunately despite lots and lots of attempts from us the clinicians the government haven't shifted the ministry of health haven't shifted their stance Thank you, Wayne. That was really enjoyable. Um, I wonder if you could speculate for us what you think some of the biggest challenges are on the horizon for IVF and reproductive medicine. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. No, that's right. I think you might be able to best answer that question. <laughs> um, 
Well, having been out of the field, I, one of the issues is um, the biggest challenges here in New Zealand is um, a number one, it's successful, uh, uh, but the access isn't great compared to other modern countries. So for example, um, an excellent neighbours Australia, the, the the rate of IVF is probably four or five fold higher than it is here. So that's one of the challenges to try and get better. Um, access to it, particularly as women age and fertility rates decline. And that's a real, real issue. As fertility rates decline, I think IVF technologies are going to become even more important. Thank you, Wayne. Okay. I'm not sure how relevant this question is to a historical analysis, but um, the uh, I don't know what you might think of what's happening in America with them. Um, uh, in some states declaring an embryo a child yes. and in uh, you could perhaps relate it to your work here years ago and and uh, i'd be interested in what you think gosh um that's a tricky tricky one isn't it i mean uh, for those who aren't aware of it i think some states an embryo uh, once embryos are created they are stored in liquid nitrogen if they're not used and and often they stay there um, because the, the, the recipients have no use for them. So what um, IVF clinics do is that after, in New Zealand, 10 years, and our legislation after 10 years, they can remove them, destroy them. The states in question have said that's illegal because the embryo has the status of a child. Um, a frozen embryo has the status of a child. Oh. Well, oh, that's a difficult one. I, 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 have a, I have a viewpoint that that's ridiculous, but there we are. Um, but there are many people that probably don't agree with it. So. One, one of the things that I found quite interesting with that was the reduction rates of adoption over the years. Is that a New Zealand issue, or are you seeing that right through the Western world that those rates are de decreasing by that kind of massive yeah, percentage? I think so. Um, uh, certainly the Western world, Danny, um, and not so the non-Western world because um, uh, in a lot of countries abortion is um, illegal and, 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 and a lot of couples seeking adopted babies in New Zealand go to places like Russia and previously Ukraine and things to actually get their adopted child. Um, so it was quite a big industry because there are lots of countries with a lot of unwanted children there. Given there's quite a lot of uh, work involved in the tubular surgery, can you give a rough cost comparison between uh, restoring fertility by that means versus IVF? Um, <laughs> gosh, David, the only, uh, I suppose a microsurgical operation, I, look, I don't know, as a guess, I would, a microsurgical operation would, would probably cost, I don't know, $15,000, $20,000. I don't know about that. An IVF, a cycle of IVF is about the same, um, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a fraction less. It's, it's really hard to, to know. But, <clears throat> but the, the tragedy of the microsurgery is that there were two or three of us in New Zealand doing microsurgery, um, uh, but you just can't train it, you know, so therefore it just disappears, you know. Other question? No more questions. I'd like the audience, please, to join with me and thank Wayne for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.